Okay, it's uh, 9.45, so we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Liz Martin. I am just here as uh, tech support. I'm the room host and I'm photo editor at the Gazette. Um, I'm going to be working just in the back end to make sure everything runs smoothly. So um, welcome to the final session of the Iowa Ideas Conference. Don't forget after this we do have a keynote um, and then after that we also have a virtual kind of social hour where you can gather in different rooms um, to network and discuss the issues that we've been talking about here at the conference. So you are in the community development track and the group violence intervention um, session. So your moderator is uh, Rachel Rockwell and she is the program coordinator at the Greater Cedar Rapids Community Foundation. I will let her take it from here. And remember, if you have questions for our panelists, please submit those in the chat function of Whova. I have disabled the uh, chat function here in Zoom so that I will be kind of basically shuttling things from Whova to Zoom. So Rachel, I will let you take it from here. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> like Liz said, I'm Rachel Rockwell, and I am Program Officer at the Greater Sea Rapids Community Foundation for the Safe, Equitable, and Thriving Communities Fund. And I have the pleasure of being moderator today for the, this session that is introducing Group Violence Intervention, I'll feel here as GVI, um, to the Cedar Rapids community. I first became familiar with the GVI model um, uh, about a year, a year and a half ago, and um, have, have had the pleasure to work with our three panelists, um, get to know our three panelists, and we have um, a, a future of implementing GVI in the Cedar Rapids community. We look forward to reducing um, youth violence and gun violence in our community through the implementation of that model. And so today, you're going to have a chance to learn a little bit more about each of our panelists and learn a little bit more about the GBI model. And so um, let's start with just some, some introductions to um, each of our panelists here. Um, I will start with uh, Lori. Um, Lori Owen currently works as the Associate Director on the Group Violence Intervention Team at the National Network uh, for Safe Communities. Before that, she worked at the New York State Division of Criminal Justice Services on their Gun Involved Violence Elimination, which um, is an acronym for GIVE um, initiative, and before that was a police officer in Westport, Connecticut. Lori is also a member of the Delaware County Op Opioid Task Force on the criminal justice team. She co-authored a book, She Healed, about healing from trauma and violence. So um, I'll give each one of you a, a little bit of a chance to tell a little bit more about yourself, but I'll go on and introduce um, our second panelist, who is Paul David Smith. Paul's an educator and a researcher. He spent his adult life educating young people as a classroom teacher, mentor, and community leader. His, his focus is on social justice and community empowerment. Um, Paul has a, a bio that goes on for quite a while. Um, I would love for him to tell us more about his experience um, with the city of Chattanooga, Tennessee as public safety coordinator, and also his role as at the National Network for Safe Communities, um, where he currently serves as director of reconciliation. Um, his organizational goals are unity and excellence. He's a father and a husband and very dedicated to his family. Wow. <laughs> wow, okay. This is what your bio says, and this is what we're going to do. Last, but in no way least, I'd like to introduce Caitlin Emmerich. Caitlin is the Assessment and Health Promotion Supervisor at Lynn County Public Health. She leads a team that focuses on utilizing data to inform systems, environmental and policy change through collaboration with partners to support the public health system. Uh, she has experience in public health research and practice at the state and local level. Um, before her current role, she was epidemiologist at Wayne County Public Health. And she also served on served on the disease surveillance program um, as manager at 
Black Hawk County Health Department in Waterloo. Um, Caitlin will be able to tell a little bit more about herself also, but she just was honored um, with the 2020 40 Under 40 Award given by the Corridor Business Journal um, and recognizing her as a leader under the age of 40 who has made a significant impact in this community through their, her, her career. And so congratulations, Caitlin. Thank you for being willing to um, spend your morning with us um, on this panel. So um, I'll, I'll start with Lori and um, Lori, could you just tell us a little bit more about yourself and how you found yourself on this panel today and your, your current role? Sure. So, um, so as mentioned, um, I was a police officer and um, I actually was injured um, in the line of duty. And, you know, one of the things that had drawn me into policing was, you know, I wanted to affect change and I wanted to help people and I wanted to make a difference. And, um, and I often felt frustrated by my ability to do that. And so it was sort of a, you know, one door closing and another door opening. And so I, um, you know, I went back and finished a master's in criminal justice and I was given an opportunity to work with New York State when they were originally implementing their gun involved violence elimination program, which really focused on evidence based strategies to reduce gun violence. And so um, through that work, I met David Kennedy and his team at National Network, and it just seemed like a, a natural fit to to kind of join this team. One of the things that's been really important to me because of my background in law enforcement is legitimacy. And so, um, you know, if I, if I accomplish one thing, it is to, you know, make law enforcement legitimate and to build those community relationships between, you know, um, law enforcement and, and the communities that they serve. And I want to, you know, to be able to do that in a way that, um, we can all we can all feel good about and so that's been really important to me and also just you know realizing that um you know and through kind of writing about trauma just realizing that um a lot of violence is driven by trauma and and a lot of there's a lot of different intervention points that we that we work through um in the course of, of trying to just reduce gun violence and i think that um you know really taking the time to kind of think about root causes and think about violence as, you know, as a, a larger um, problem in society is, is just something that I'm passionate about. And so I think there's, there's a whole lot of reasons that sort of led me to where I am, but I'm thankful. Um, I'm thankful that I've gotten here and I, and I really am passionate about the work that we do at National Network and the team that we have here is top notch. And so I'm just thankful to be a part of it and I'm thankful to be here today. So I look forward to, to this panel. Thank you, Lori. Uh, Paul, tell us a little bit about, about more about yourself and your role and why you're on this panel today. Sure, um, I got into the work when I was a school principal I had a school that had uh, 13 very distinct uh, groups or gangs. And then I think maybe about 20 or so what I used to call JV groups or gangs. And when I would just see what was happening with those individuals, with their families and how individuals were sometimes second and third generations going into the same things that they had been in, their parents and grandparents had probably dipped their toes in. Um, when I realized that a lot of individuals are not dealing with traditional PTSD. That's that post-traumatic stress. A lot of these individuals and families and communities are dealing with present traumatic stress. This is different from crisis. It's, it's always with you and it's something that has to be addressed. And uh, when our new mayor became uh, the mayor in 2013, he asked me to step away from that role. I read David's book, heard David Kennedy speak and basically said, yeah, I wanna go do that right there. And let's bring the group, volume, group violence down in our city. And so that's what we did. Um, and just being a part of that, addressing trauma, I think making sure that we are addressing the trauma of communities, the trauma of individuals, uh, because traumatized people, uh, traumatize people and making sure that we're able to address those through an initiative that reduces harm, 
uh, enhances legitimacy and makes sure that we're involving members of the community to, to exact some informal social control. Uh, those are the things that really turned me on about this initiative and uh, why I basically changed careers to come and do it. Thank you, Paul. Caitlin, tell us a little bit more about yourself and your role and how it connects to, to safety and, and public health safety initiatives. Sure, thank you, Rachel. Um, so as Rachel mentioned, I'm the Assessment and Health Promotion Supervisor here at Lane County Public Health. And um, my connection to this session is through our Community Health Improvement Plan. In 2018, our community prioritized safety as one of our top three health issues. And um, as you can make the connection, um, group violence intervention is one of the strategies to increase safety in our community. And so for the last couple of years, um, we have been embarking on this new top strategic issue. Safety has not been a, a top health issue for us before. And so we've learned lots about um, practices to increase safety and community safety and neighborhood safety and have really started to work with some community partners that we haven't worked with before. And um, so that is how I got to be here today um, through the things that we've learned along the way. Perfect. So for our audience who haven't read David Kennedy's book, haven't been to um, the National Network for Safe Communities Conference um, on Group Violence Intervention. What is Group Violence Intervention? Um, how does it work? Um, and I'll let anyone start who wants to, to feel that. Well, Lori? I can <laughs> um, so the Group Violence Intervention is based on research that shows that a very small number of folks within a city are responsible for the overwhelming amount of violence. And, you know, we, we talk a lot about group violence and, um, and sometimes we talk about groups interchangeably with gangs, but um, the distinction is that, you know, all gangs are groups, but not all groups are gangs. And what that means is that you know, we, we work with street crews or, you know, local neighborhood cliques um, but what we really focus on is, you know, two or more people that are hanging out together that are at high risk to kill or be killed. And frankly, you know, in the cities that we work with, you know, historically, um, you know, we've heard terms like, oh, this is a bad neighborhood, right? Or, or, you know, this is a bad area. And the truth is, is that the overwhelming majority of folks in that area are not dangerous people. It's a really small number of folks within any city that are responsible for driving the violence. And so what the group violence intervention does is it focuses on those folks that are most at risk to kill or be killed. And there's a process for, for identifying that, right? It takes in, you know, intelligence that is gathered, it takes data, it takes information from folks that are on the ground in the city that are front and center to what's going on. And we, we determine who, who's driving the violence, right? What groups are responsible for violence? And we reach out to them. We message them. We, you know, we talk to them about, you know, about what their risk looks like and, and how we can help. And, you know, but what we do is we focus on accountability for the groups. And so that means that if Paul and Rachel and Caitlin and I all hang out together and we're, we're close knit, you know, we spend all our time together, um, you know, Paul is more likely to be able to influence my behavior than, than even the police or, or anyone around me. And so we use those dynamics to be able to kind of reduce the violence by, by you know, putting pressure on groups. And that, that could come from you know, a variety of different ways. But, but I, you know, we, we focus on a harm reduction strategy. We focus on you know, offering a way out to those who want it. So the way that we kind of think about group violence intervention is um, that we will we will stop you if you make us, but we will help you if you let us. And the idea is that we want to be able to offer folks something different than what they've been receiving. And so just to kind of drill down for one minute on, um, on the numbers, what we see overwhelmingly in cities is that about 0.6% of a population in the city 
is responsible for upwards of 50% of the homicide. So when we think about what 0.6% of a population is, it takes a really big problem of violence and makes it kind of small and manageable and it makes it something that can be focused on. And so that's really the, the group violence intervention in a nutshell. And Paul, am I, am I leaving anything out? No, absolutely. Um, I, I appreciate uh, the fact that this, this is direct sustained engagement. Uh, we're not uh, specifically talking about just enforcement here. We're talking about engagement with that small, very small group of noble individuals who drive the violence. And, and I appreciate the fact that this, this initiative brings uh, sworn community and non-sworn community and, 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 and folks who can provide services, brings them all together so that they can together focus on those individuals who drive violence in the community. Um, but it, to Lori's point, this is not a, a program. Uh, it's an approach. And, and that approach says that the partnership uh, that gives a credible community moral message against the violence in that partnership. It, it could be the members who are of the com community who are sworn, members of the community who are not sworn. And then they offer that help collectively and that support to those who want it. Um, and then law enforcement basically says, here, here are the legal consequences for further violence. Here's your legal exposure now. We're not here to arrest you now for that stuff. We're here to let you know, knock off the violence, uh, period. And so when, when there's that offer of help that says, we are, we'll help you if you let us, but we'll stop you if you make us, here are the things that we can help you with. But whether you accept the offer of help or not, the community stands together for you because we want you to be successful doing the right things in your rightful place in the community, uh, but we're standing against the violence. And so we'd love to have you out of prison in your, we'd love to have you safe, alive and out of prison in your rightful place in the community, just not shooting at people and killing people. Or the alternative is that there's prison here. There are things that the law enforcement is gonna to have to do in response to your violence. So it's letting folks know exactly where we're, where we're going, what's happening, what the rules of the game are, we're letting you know how we're playing ball moving forward, asking you to just not, not commit violence, not shoot and kill people. And we would like to help you uh, into a better life. Th that is, it's as plain as that, it's as simple as that, but I love the fact that it brings the community together and the fact that law enforcement has to be conscious of messaging, how they're talking with individuals, who they're talking with, and law enforcement is working with the non-sworn community to bring peace in the community and empowering the community for, to, to exact their informal social control. Thank you, Paul. Sure. You, you mentioned uh, cross-sector collaboration. Mm -hmm. What has that looked like in, in other communities? Can paint a picture of, of what that looks like and, and why it works. Um, so that we in Cedar Rapids can, can also have that picture. Sure, let's talk about uh, custom notification. That'll be one of the things that uh, as a part of this approach, uh, you'll do. A custom notification will be, you, say you have an incident that happens in the community, there's a shooting that happens in the community. And uh, we know the victim side of it because they're the ones who showed up at the hospital. And uh, we know that side, uh, we have an idea of the other side, uh, we have officers who have hopped on social media and uh, these, these young gangsters who say, people are snitching on me. They're telling me, they're telling all my business. Um, we can, you can honestly say to those guys, no, you snitched on yourself. You put your business on Facebook. We have folks who are checking out their social media and we have that person who's shot. The custom notification uh, team will include law enforcement who brings, they'll pull up that person's record, they'll pull up whatever they can about the incident, and they have that printed and ready to go. Law enforcement will call members of the community who are not sworn. They'll call folks who are social service providers. They'll, they'll call folks who can bring uh, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy to the table. They're folks who can bring uh, the job training and help, help folks just with connecting with services. Those people will be called by law enforcement and say, hey, we have an individual who was shot. We think we know the other side. Can you provide services? Can you go with this so we can give this individual the message? that you are able to give services for them. Just, we're gonna tell them not to retaliate, but here are some alternatives. And then 
we'll also call that mother who has lost a child to violence and let her know we have to go speak to someone who might be trying to get some payback for what has happened to them. That team of individuals, a law enforcement officer, a service provider, a mother who's lost a child to violence will go to that person's hospital bed, or if they're released, they'll go to that person's home, wherever we can find that person. And there's the other side that we will know about as well. And go to that person and give them a three pronged message. Number one from community and everyone there, we're so sorry this happened to you and we're here to support you. Law enforcement will say, guys, we're here is, if you go back and get retaliation, this is what could happen here because we have an eye on this now. We're looking at this incident, we're looking at you and we believe we know who shot you. And so we're giving them that message. And, but, and then you have the service provider who says, look, we would love to help you with all kinds of, and they give them the menu of things that they're offering. And that is basically law enforcement has brought service providers to the victim uh, or to someone who's involved in group violence to offer them help. Let them know we know who you are. You're not anonymous. Uh, we're standing in your living room or we're standing in your hospital room. So we know who you are. We know who you hang out with. We know that you have been shot and we very likely know who shot you. But we're now we're going to turn it over to somebody from your community who may look like somebody you know. And that's when that mother gets in that person's uh, space and says, look, we, our community appreciates you. We want to see you safe, alive, and out of prison. I don't want to see you go to jail. Please do not go get retaliations. Please cut out this violence that you and your folks are involved in. Do not put another mother through what I've been through. And please don't go out here and do this kind of stuff that gets you into the situation where your mother will be going through what I've been through. Take them up on the help. These officers are not playing with you, but they're here for that reason. They didn't come in to kick in, uh, kick, us, uh, kick in the door for a search warrant. They didn't come to drag anybody out on, on and arrest them. And they did not come to serve a death notice. They're here because they want to see you safe, alive, and out of prison. That approach, that three-pronged messaging that comes from sworn and non-sworn community is how you bring them together for, for a quick event as a response to a shooting. That's powerful. And usually the most powerful voice is not the mother. I mean, excuse me, it's not the, the, the police. It's not the service provider. It's usually that mother who's saying, listen to these guys. That way you're bringing the whole community together and we can replace the mother with someone else, a, a reverend. We can replace the mother with uh, someone who's been there, done that, a, a former gangster, who's someone who's been locked up and can say, hey, you don't want to uh, do go through what I've been through. They can debunk the street code. It's about the community messaging. That's the securest way of answering your question, but I hope I've answered it. <laughs> you did a great job answering that question. <laughs> Uh, Caitlin, we've talked a lot about cross-sector collaboration and engaging community members. Um, tell me what your experience is or what, what do you know about the challenges of engaging the community to collaborate? Sure, sure Rachel. Um, first of all, I want to just applaud what everything that Pauline Smith just said about um, cross-sector collaboration is what the foundation of a lot of our work is built on. So um, I think that we could, you know, continue to go in, uh, go on about the importance of cross-sector collaboration, but there are definitely challenges that come along with it. Um, it's hard work. I, I mean, I think the first thing that I'll put out there is that it is hard work. And um, it's a commitment, and it takes a commitment from all of the people that are going to say, I'm going to be part of this. I come from this sector over here, and it's not what I do for my, you know, main job or spend most of my time or whatever, um, but I'm going to commit to doing this. And um, so that kind of already, you know, puts a, puts a situation into place where we really need to push through the challenges that exist to make it be successful. Um, but the reason that we do it is because we are so much more effective when we work together. So that's what we have to keep in mind when we are thinking about, oh my gosh, this is hard work, this, this collaborating with other people and aligning our vision together. Um, it's going to make the, the uh, in, in initiative and the effort, it's going to make it more efficient. Um, and I think that some things that we have to acknowledge that people bring to the table when we're, they're coming together for collaboration is that there's history that exists. There's existing turf that exists. 
um, there's existing relationships that exist. And so we have to acknowledge those. We have to acknowledge that all of that exists, but say we still have a common goal in place and we still want to make positive change. And so we are going to acknowledge that all that happens, but we're still going to move forward towards meeting our common goal. Um, for individuals, you know, kind of what kind of what Paul was talking about are uh, individuals that might be part of that custom notification process. It's a time commitment for them. That's a barrier. You know, they have to invest their own time. They might have an, a, their own agenda that they bring to the conversation or bring Absolutely. to the table. Um, the the role is not always clear for somebody. When you ask them to come and be part of something, they they really need to have a very clear role of what they're being asked to do. They might not have the expertise, so we might have to help them learn about what the, what the goal is. Um, and then for agency partnerships, there's financial resources. You know, those are, might be staff time, but they might be other, other financial resources. Um, and then uh, sometimes people might come to the table and want to control the agenda, but it might not be their role to control the agenda. So we have to acknowledge that as well. Um, so there are, definitely, there are definitely challenges with collaborating, but it doesn't mean that it's not worth doing. Definitely worth doing, we just have to acknowledge what those are and move through them. speak from experience, I can tell. I just um, invite Lori um, or Paul to, to kind of um, follow up with the discussion about the challenges um, that communities can, can have in implementing the GDI model and, and with, with collaboration. And maybe there's some, a story you could tell, um, a warning you could give us or, or some, some good advice about what not to do. Absolutely. Uh, I've run into situations in, in three different jurisdictions where I was on the ground ready to go do a custom notification or ready to do this work. And um, I just want to say to law enforcement, um, if this kind of feels like hug a thug or you, you know, say, oh, this is just a bunch of hug a thug. Um, in many ways, you're right. Um, I'm a former school principal and I hug thugs. Uh, those mothers who have lost children to violence, uh, when you bring them out on these uh, custom notifications, uh, they're going to hug thugs. COVID notwithstanding, okay, in the light of that. Uh, but there are going to be those folks who are from the community who don't wear a badge, who are not afraid to hug the thugs, uh, who are not afraid to embrace these guys and say, look, we re realize you've been traumatized. Uh, let's go do it. So. To, to the sworn officers, let me just assure you, you don't have to go hug thugs if you don't want to. There are plenty of us who will. Your role in this is to go ahead and give that time and to be that peace officer, to be that one who brings the peace, um, And period. You're still the police, uh, but you're just treating people in a way that's legitimate and you're operating in a way that's procedurally just. To those folks who are part of the non-sworn community, I've run into, and I have felt this myself, to where you're having to go to speak to someone who you know has a record, you know they have done some violence before, you know they have uh, committed violence. And you're having to go to that individual and say to that individual, we wanna see you safe, alive and out of prison. In light of everything that has happened, we still wanna see you safe, alive and out of prison. And you're taking those individuals to go speak to folks who may not want to speak with them. So it's, it's not uncommon to take them to an agency uh, where the person sitting behind the desk is looking at them like, what are you here for? And they're talking English and the person with them is talking English. The time commitment is that, 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 that instead of just sending them to the next door, and saying, go do whatever they tell you to go fill out whatever paperwork they ask you to fill out. The time commitment is that true social worker, that true, per those, those folks who are really about this life are going to go with that person and, and just assume that when the, when the person behind the counter hands them a clipboard, their literacy levels may be to the point that I need to help read that for you. I need to help bridge this gap here. So my time commitment is that I have to be present. 
the others, everyone else here, has, there's a commitment of time, of course, but there's also a commitment of mission. What's the mission of, of where I'm working? What, what's the mission of my job? Am I fulfilling my mission by doing this work in the community? 99.9% .9 of the time is yes. Uh, so the question that all of us need to ask while doing this work is besides just money, besides just time, what does yes need to look like? And whatever yes needs to look like, if we can get to yes, legitimately include the folks with us who are doing this work and can impact this community, let's all get on board. Let's define our lanes, fit in where we get in, get in where we fit in and do the work so we can save lives in our community. That's the bottom line for, for a lot of people who do the work. It's not so much just time. It's not so much just money. It's about the will and the willingness to deprivatize our practice, tear down our community silos and work with folks who come from other silos. Yeah, actually, if I can just add on to that, you know, I think one, you know, when you talk about obstacles, those are the obstacles, right? It is those silos. It is that sort of, you know, people have always kind of worked within their own agenda, right? And their own <laughs> sort of goal set and yeah. to, to come together to prioritize this type of effort means, you know, rethinking sometimes how you engage across partnerships. It means being able to say, you know, it's not about who's taking credit for the outcome, but the fact that we're all going to be here together to celebrate the outcome. And I think that is something that, um, can be challenging. I mean, and I think, you know, to, to say, it's one thing to say these partnerships are important because we know that. I mean, Paul and I and, and Caitlin, I'm sure we can talk all day about the importance of those partnerships, but, you know, the challenge and the obstacles are sometimes getting everybody to a place where they can say, we're all in no matter what, and we're going to keep working even when it's hard, and we're going to have those hard conversations every day, and we're going to keep coming to the table on the days when it's when you know when things are feeling kind of grim or we don't necessarily agree with everyone you know and that that's you know what Paul and I that's what we do and I'm sure Caitlin too we have those hard conversations every day and I think when when there's a willingness to keep showing up every single day and commit every single day you will get where you need to go and to Caitlin's point and it was it, it, co case management is what we have to do um, when you're looking at multiple agencies, uh, Caitlin is so right. Not every agency does everything. And sometimes you have to help agencies uh, join hands, uh, join grants, uh, and have the agencies not practice social service gangbanging and competing with each other for grants and slitting each other's for, uh, throats for grants, but getting on the same page and collaborating on grants. Uh, I think when, you, when, we, when we look at tearing down the silos amongst the social service agencies and helping social workers co-case manage and show the police how to be a part of the co-case management structure and so the non-sworn community how to be a part of a non-case management structure, that way we're bringing communities together. So I, I did not want that point to be lost in the conversation. Thank you all, wonderful discussion. I am going to um, kind of shift a little bit. Um, one thing that struck me in at the 2019 um, National Network for Safe Communities Conference and have, has continued to um, be a, an eye opener for me uh, as I have learned more about the GDI um, model is that um, you're really pretty careful about um, some terminology that you use. And so um, you use the word groups instead of gangs. Um, never once at the, the conference did I hear anyone talk about gun violent perpetrators and, and, um, and kind of separate the perpetrators from, from victims. Um, you're using language that, that um, kind of says that, you know, here are the people who are most at risk of violent victimization instead of, you know, separating them out. Um, and then um, I just, I feel like well, another thing that I've heard often when we're talking about um, gun violence or when communities or people in our communities are talking about gun violence is the terminology black on black crime. And that's 
that's something I've never heard um, in in respect to um, the GBI model. And I think I think that's purposeful. I think that's intentional, and it's for a reason. And so I'm I'm curious about um, you know what maybe even language or terminology, um, belief systems or ideologies do communities hold around gun violence that that get in the way of implementing solutions? And and I would love to hear about that. So I think, oh, right. Go ahead, Lori. Right, sorry. Um, so I think first and foremost, I think, you know, when you, when you use words like perpetrator, you know, it, it does have a negative connotation and, you know, here's the bottom line, you know, folks that are victims are also the ones that are just as likely to be a trigger puller tomorrow. And so, you know, that's something that we see over and over again. And so, you know, I think when we talk about at risk, it's to kill or be killed. And it's not, you know, most likely to perpetrate, you know, it's about, um, you know, the risk level. And I think, you know, what, what we also need to understand is, you know, for these young men that are in these groups, they're facing levels of risk and violence that are equivalent to what soldiers would face if they were in times of war. And so to ignore the fact that there is trauma there, right? To ignore the fact that, you know, that these folks are facing such great risk every day, you know, does a disservice to the overall community, really. I mean, you know, it's not about locking people up, it's about saving lives. And, you know, the other thing is that, um, you know, the reason that we don't make it about color is because, you know, that's what's caused harm in the past. You know, those practices of going into neighborhoods of color and doing enforcement over and over again and over policing those neighborhoods has caused harm. And what we do is work to reduce harm. And the way we do that is by focusing on folks that are at risk for violence. So, are, are a lot of those people, people of color? Absolutely, but we're focusing on what their risk looks like, not what their skin looks like. And that's an important distinction because when it does come time to have to pull levers or do some type of sanctioning, you know, that does not translate into going into communities of color and, you know, doing an occupation, right? It does not mean we go into communities of color and stop, you know, young black and brown men because they live there. Because most of those young black and brown men that live there are not the ones that are driving the violence. And so, you know, we talk so much about risk because our scope is so narrow. And we do want to focus on that small number of people that are driving violence and not, not communities that just have already been harmed. And so, you know, we are careful in making that distinction because, you know, when it comes time to sanction, you know, what, what we what we always talk about is, you know, and, and I say sanction and not enforcement because we're changing our way of thinking about that as well. You know, when, when I say to you enforcement, right, it, it seems aggressive and it comes across, it, you know, it could be triggering to communities that have been over-policed, right? When we say sanctioning, you know, that gives us a lot of lower level type levers that we can use that can change behavior but aren't damaging someone for life. And so, um, what we are careful about is, is first and foremost is harm. And, you know, one of the things that we think about every day is, you know, when we go out and we go into this neighborhood, are we causing harm? And if we are, then we would, we don't do it right. We, we want to be able to say with moral certainty that, you know, we're going to be on the right side of history and that we're doing the right things and that we are, you know, empowering communities and not harming them. So that's why we are so careful about the way we talk about it. And, and again, um, you know, because it is a small number of folks that are driving violence, if you look within that small number, such a high number of them have already been victimized. And so it, it's, the, it's the same folks that are, that are both, um, you know, getting shot and then shooting. And so, um, you know, we need to wrap our arms around them and, and bring them to, to a different place instead of, you know, focusing on them for punishment. Paul, did you want to add on? Paul's muted. All right. One of the conversations I had with a police officer uh, about 
this very issue. Uh, our first conversation before we came close friends, um, he said that I was an enabler because he had read letters that I had written, uh, character letters that I had written in court to a certain judge about a certain kid. And I saw that kid as my student. He saw that kid as a perpetrator. One way we could both approach it is he's a community member and we're gonna treat him as such. Um, and today he's a perpetrator um, who hit somebody or slapped somebody or kicked somebody or shot somebody. But let's remember the fact that two months ago he was shot and he lost his best friend in an incident. And so what, are, what is our response? Is our response just enforcement? Or can we do some engagement and can we do some other things that involves the community to address that trauma so that that young man doesn't act out of trauma? So uh, to Lori's point, we don't label people based on just whatever yesterday's action was because today and yesterday and very likely tomorrow, if they're still alive, they'll be community members. Thank you. When, when you talk about community members, um, that we're, we're talking about everyone who lives in that community and, and has the experiences of that community. And that includes our law enforcement. And um, many times you know, we, we make that, that separation when we're having conversations about um, community and law enforcement. And we talk about the relationship between community members and, and law enforcement. Can, can you talk to me a little bit about that um, those relationships within the community that are so import important um, to implementing this GBI um, model. And um, Paul, I think you, you talk about um, legitimacy and, um, and uh, perceived legitimacy and, and trust. And could you, could you talk a little bit more about the importance of that in reducing violence in the community? Sure. Um... One of the core principles um, of, of NNSC is to enhance legitimacy. Uh, that's the recognition of the fact that the community's trust or, or lack thereof um, in the police is it's, it's pivotal. It's pivotal. It's, it, it's, it's, it's pivotal to affecting public safety and the work of police there. Legitimacy says that we believe, that the community members believe that the agents of the law are there to protect uh, the public. They're there to do so fairly and they have the right motives in doing so. And so while legitimacy, it's always been an implicit component of our GBI, we acknowledge that there should be uh, an intentionality to the way police handle uh, the community. The community is looking for procedural justice. So I could be wrong in, in whatever I've done, whatever you stop me for, but it's how you treat me when you stop me. It's how you talk to me when you stop me. Are you always posed with, with your hand perched on your gun, ready to pull it out of its holster? Are you talking to me respectfully? How are we uh, talking to individuals? How do we handle the community when we see them in any given situation or role? The other piece is what are the policies that we are um, acting within and are they causing harm to the community? Uh, do we, are we, are we is, it, is it legitimate to clear corners? Um, it's, I don't think it's against the law to clear corners, but when you're just driving by and saying, y'all get off the corner, that's not legit. And how police treat individuals, it's, it, are you just coming up slapping handcuffs on and reading my rights and then and throwing me in the car? Or are you saying, here's why we're here today. This is why you're being arrested today. It's how you treat individuals, that legitimacy and the perceptions of legitimacy are extremely important because when the community feels that the police are not legit, they won't step forward and say, uh, I can give you information about this crime. They won't even call 911 because they don't believe that the actions that the police, that who they're calling will be legit when they arrive. So legitimacy is absolutely important and perceptions of police legitimacy are lowest, unfortunately, in communities most directly affected by serious violence. So this community anger, this distrust, this silence, they're not, 
the, uh, law enforcement sometimes think that it's tolerance of crime and violence, it's tolerance of this. But even in communities where the crime is high, 99.999% of those people are not driving the violence. The community just d doesn't want the cops to come in and occupy, doesn't want you to come in and saturate, doesn't want you to come in. And when, when we're driving down the street, see 12, 11, 13, 14 guys up against the wall spread eagle or on your car spread eagle. If you're coming to the community and you're coming to do what's right in the community, grab those who are driving the violence of the community. Be focused on the ones who are driving violence. Don't terrorize the whole community. And when, 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 when communities have respect for police or believe that police are legitimate, uh, this, they will, they're more likely to have community support. They're more likely to have community who are ready to comply with law enforcement. And in these instances, people are more likely to come forward and testify if they know that the police, if they know that they can solve those crimes and if they know that they can protect them. And if they know that after the police leave the community, the, pol the community will be safer because of how their actions have been and how they've handled the community in dealing with the community. And if I can just layer on that, you know, it comes down to transparency. Absolutely. Right? Like you, you, if you are changing your way of doing business and you need to be able to articulate that to your community and be able to say, this is what our process looks like. This is why we're focusing the way we're focusing and this is what we're doing. And that right there is how you begin to build that trust. And, and it doesn't happen overnight. It really doesn't. It takes time. Yeah. Thank you. I, I do want to remind um, audience members that they can submit uh, questions for the panel. Um, I do have some more questions. We've got about 15 more minutes. So if you, if you have some specific, uh, something specific, please send that on through to us. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about um, implementation of GVI in communities across the United States. So the National Network for Safe Communities provides technical assistance um, in a number of different communities to help them implement this model and um, have seen success in reducing numbers of shots fired reducing group related homicides and, and um, gun violence overall in a number of communities. Um, we are about to embark on um, receiving technical assistance from the National Network for Safe Communities in our community. What does that look like? And um, what can we anticipate and uh, as, a, as a result of, of doing this work? So I think in order to, um, you know, to kind of launch this, right, it, it involves an analysis. So we need to first and foremost, really understand what the, what the violence looks like, what the dynamics are like in, in, in each city that we work with. And, you know, we do see trends, obviously, you know, the groups that are driving violence are, you know, it's a small number of people and, and that is consistent. However, um, you know, when we come into a city to be able to assess who are those groups, what are they engaging in, right? You know, what kind of activities, who are they beefing with? What are the ages? And sort of, you know, really kind of flushing out not only, um, you know, what the, the factors are that drive violence, but also who is driving the violence. And then really it's about establishing the partnerships that we talked about, building infrastructure, right? Like, when we come into a city and we are making offers of help to folks, we need to make sure that we have the infrastructure to follow through on those offers of help because everything that we do is going to come down to being credible, both in our offer of help, but also when we're talking about police action and activity, it all has to be legitimate. And so um, coming into a city, it's, you know, who do we have on our bench? Who's our team? You know, we, we come together and say, okay, how are we gonna hold each other accountable? What's the executive process going to be? You know, Who's going to drive the work? Who's leading this work? How are we holding each other accountable? And then also you know, really assessing like roles, right? What partners do we have? Do we have you know, a, a good commitment from law enforcement? What law enforcement agencies? I mean, we talk a lot about police, but do we have probation? Do we have parole? Do we have the district attorney's office? Do we have the US attorney's office? Do we have ATF? Do we have FBI, right? We, do we have sheriff's office? Do we have all these people? And then on the support and outreach side, 
you know, to map our assets and say, you know, do we have housing? Do we have, you know, job readiness? Do we have case management? Do we have folks that are going to be able to wrap around these individuals and support them? And then, you know, on the community side, you know, do we have people that are willing to, to make a commitment to our effort and say, you know, we want to go out and be part of the messaging. We want to be doing affirmative outreach. We want to be, you know, part of, of all of this infrastructure. And honestly, when we get that team assembled, you know, then it really becomes about us helping each team to really identify their roles, um, to, to kind of take ownership of each of their tasks and then, you know, kind of start what would I call like the cycle of GVI, which, you know, there's not a start and an end, it's a circle. So it's, you know, we gather our information, we do our messaging, we'll do our sanctioning, we follow up with, you know, debriefing that. It's always this constant balance of, of communication and, and messaging and, and really just constantly making sure that we are engaging both internally and externally. Paul, did you wanna add on to that? I think Lori said it great. Um... The only thing I would add to that uh, is just making sure that we're keeping it intentional. Uh, that we're intentionally staying together. Um, you have three buckets that you're dealing with. And this is uh, to Lori's point, uh, you have law enforcement, you have those support and outreach service providers, and then you have your, uh, your non-sworn community who are your, your voices, uh, your, your community moral voices. Having the three of those uh, buckets uh, continuously operating and sustaining the work through its evolutions. So the work won't look in 2022 like it does in 2020. If it does, something's wrong in the universe. And making sure that we're bringing those groups together, continuously aligning our work and, and looking at what's the violence level on the ground. If we're doing a whole lot of work and we have a lot more people getting uh, diplomas and a lot more people getting job placement, but the violence is not being impacted, uh, we have to go back and look at what we're doing. Uh, this, at the, at the end of the day, all of this is not a jobs program. All of this is not uh, a, a tally mark for how many people can, we can get into our cognitive behavioral therapy. This is not uh, anything but is the violence being reduced in the community and are we reducing the levels of harm that law enforcement and other agencies have done in our communities? Uh, we want the violence down and we wanna reduce harm and enhance legitimacy. All the other things are not ancillary, but they're a part of that. They're all a greater part of the whole. So I would just add that, just sustaining all of those uh, those, those community voices. And when I say community, um, let me just be clear, police are a part of the community. That's two words. They are a part of the community, not a part, one word, from the community. Police are a part of our community. And I had a social uh, service provider and street outreach worker in Minneapolis uh, just last week uh, tell a group of, of, of folks in, uh, of social service providers and outreach workers, we can't do this without the police. We just need police acting legitimately, period. Thank you. Caitlin, I, uh, yeah, please. So one thing I kind of want to point out is that um, there were two words in my notes around community engagement that Lori and Paul said, credibility and intentionality. So um, from, from my perspective, it doesn't matter what kind of public health initiative or health initiative that you have engagement of community members and community partners like law enforcement or other people in the public health system, we call it, um, must be involved to add that credibility piece to ensure there's intentionality with the implementation. Um, the other things that in my perspective, community members can bring in the implementation piece is it kind of ensures that the actions are community driven and community informed that it's appropriate and timely and you know all the things that come along with that. We also have community experts locally that can add pieces to um, the implementation. They have knowledge about the community. They're advocates. They um, can increase awareness. You know, these are all things that engagement of community members in the implementation process will benefit 
um, whether it's the, the, the GBI model or it's another model, engagement of community members are always important with implementation. Caitlin, thank you for that. I was also going to um, ask you about the, the public health model um, and, and how you see this aligning with the, the fact that GBI really is a focus approach, right? It focuses on those who are at most high risk. Um, it's, it's not a you know program or project for, for everyone um, where it's focused on violence specifically and reducing violence and, and focused on those who are at most at risk. How does that align with the, the public health model of, of addressing priorities? Sure. So in the development of our community health improvement plan that we do periodically, we look at, um, you know, what are the top issues, but also who are the populations that are disproportionately impacted? Yeah. You know, which sub subpopulations within our community um, are impacted more by whatever adverse health event that is, whether that's um, violence or whether that's cancer. You know, whatever you're looking at, it's really important to drill down and look at those subpopulations. So that's something that is, is exactly aligned with this uh, model, is looking at who are the people in the community that are disproportionately impacted? Who is that, you know, small percentage of the um, population that really needs um, the intervention, if you want to call it that, that's kind of public health language, but um, so it really aligns closely with the public health approach for things. Um, the, the other thing that I, I might be going a little bit off on your question, Rachel, but the other thing that I think that we always do in public health and public health programs is the cross-sector collaboration. I think I, we mentioned that earlier. Um, and then the importance of developing a common vision so that everyone that's part of the initiative knows what's the goal. And that's kind of what Paul was just saying. You know, what is the, what, what are you trying to do? And, and everyone knows what you're trying to do. That common vision is also really important and something that's really important in other um, public health initiatives as well. Perfect. Thank you, Caitlin. And so I'll just wrap up by what we're trying to do is reduce violence in our community. That's that's the vision, um, specifically gun violence and group violence and youth violence through bringing in the national network for safe communities to help us um, to implement the GBI model. So we're just about finished with our time today. I think we could have probably um, gone on for three or four hours and um, it, it would have still been fascinating and we would, would have still had a lot to cover. I thank each and every panelist for, for your time and your expertise and your passion around um, safety and, and reducing violence and addressing trauma. And um, thank you for all of the participants who, who came to, to listen to this panel today. I do want to um, encourage everyone to um, join the closing uh, keynote, which is David Kennedy, who is the director at the National Network for Safe Communities. Um, he's a, a fabulous speaker. And um, when I went to the conference in 2019, I got to meet him and he extended an offer of, of assistance to our community along with um, other uh, of other peers did the same for the group of um, Cedar Rapidians who were who were there in New York, and um, now here we are receiving this assistance. And so I'm, I'm certainly grateful, and I think this community is grateful um, for the time and attention. But um, really want to encourage you to jump on and listen to David Kennedy at 11. So thank you, everybody. <laughs>